Well, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. It's just a minute or two after three o'clock, and we hope that um, everyone's been able to find us. And we want to welcome all of you to today's webinar. We're very excited. Um, uh, my name is Mary Tavija, and I'm with the Consortium for Educational Change, and I'd like to welcome all of you today. As you can see, our webinar is SEL and Mindfulness, Keys to a Healthier You. And before I begin, I just want to share a little bit of information with you. This webinar is sponsored by the Literacy Organization Capacity Initiative at NORC. That's a nonpartisan and objective research organization at the University of Chicago. The director of LOCI, Kaylani Dunsmore is unable to join us in person today, but she sends her greetings to all of you and reminds you that you may find more information about LOCI at their website. You'll see that address on the screen at literacycapacity.org. LOCI has worked in collaboration with the Consortium for Educational Change, CEC, to present today's session. During this week of teacher appreciation, this offers an opportunity for all of us at LOCI and at CEC to tell educators how much we appreciate all that you do and to recognize that your chosen career is incredibly rewarding, but it can be remarkably stressful. So we hope that today's session will offer you some guidance in how to relieve some of that stress so that you can enjoy your work. During our webinar today, you're invited to participate through the chat box. I think most of you have found it. It's a little box down at the bottom of your screen that you can click on, and that will allow you to type in any comments or questions you have as you go. And um, Carla, our presenter, is going to give us a little time where we can stop and answer some of those questions. So let's get to our work today. Um, our presenter today is Carla Tantillo Filiber, and she's a recognized expert on SEL, social emotional learning, mindfulness, and yoga practices in the school setting. She's the founder of Mindful Practices, co founder of Class Catalyst, and oversees a team of dedicated practitioners who've served thousands of students and teachers across the country since 2006. Carla has a master's in curriculum and instruction and is a certified yoga teacher. Carla travels across the country and presents at numerous conferences, so I feel very fortunate to have her with us today. She's written several books about integrating SEL and mindfulness in the classroom with strategies for all ages from early childhood through high school. So I know she has a lot to offer. Carla, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that you can share yours. I'm so eager to learn alongside you with everyone today. Thanks for being with us. Well, thank you so much for having me. I am really excited to be here. Um, I, of course, know the organization and do the, let's see here. Um, let's see here. And I'm familiar with the work you do along with the work of um, Dr. Dunsmore. So thank you so much. It's really an honor. And welcome all of you. Mary, I love how you introduced the session, especially during Teacher Appreciation Week, because I think it's so important for us to say, hey, that's our truth. Our truth is that, that we love the work that we're doing, but it's also really hard work. It's all, also really challenging work, and that's okay, right? And giving ourselves permission to pause, to take a breath, and to find those keys, those keys, as I like to say, to a, to a healthier you. So let's dive in. I'd like to begin by asking everyone with us to find their device, whether that's a phone or a screen of some kind, right? And I'm gonna ask you to send a gratitude text. And so what we're going to do is we're going to engage in our device by sending a gratitude text to someone that um, we need to send a little gratitude shout out to. That could be um, a sibling, that could be a parent, that could be a child, that could be a coworker, that could be an administrator. And just pausing for a moment and sending them a text of appreciation. Then once you've done that, I'm gonna ask that you take your phone and switch it off for the rest of our time together today. And so pausing for a moment now and sending that gratitude text. I appreciate you, mother-in-law, for X, Y, Z, or whatever it might be. And then once you press send, 
then we're going to go ahead and we're going to switch off our phone. Now, one of the reasons that I like to do this is because if we are going to make space for these practices, um, unplugging from our devices is usually a pretty solid step one. If you're anything, anyone like me where you have, you know, um, a team or you have emails to send or you have colleagues that are, that are dependent upon you, that sometimes there is, they've, they've got that, they've got that link, they know that you've got that phone in hand at all times and saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to disconnect from this phone and I'm going to make the next hour just about me can be a really powerful thing. And so as Mary said, I have a background in education. I was part of a team that started a contract school in Chicago's Little Village neighborhood. I went on from that to found my business mindful practices in 2006. I'm also the author of five different books on this topic. One is called Cooling Down Your Classroom, which has a companion set of yoga cards, easy tools for teachers. And then the next is a series, the publisher Rutledge, on um, everyday SEL and mindfulness in the classroom. I'm really proud of this series. And one of the reasons is that it spans strategies span from early childhood all the way from high school. And so instead of there being one guide where teachers are thinking, hey, you know, I teach three-year-olds, I've got to make modifications, or I, I teach, you know, 15-year-olds, there are those books. And so they're ready to go for you with strategies in hand, depending on the grade band that you serve. So mindful practice as an organization, I always like to show our reach here in Chicago. Now we are a national organization. I was in San Antonio earlier this week and California the week before that. But looking at, looking at the lay of the land here in Chicago and the diverse neighborhoods that we serve, and the one of the reasons I do that is because often mindfulness or yoga or these strategies can have a certain stigma attached to them. Like, oh, they only work for this demographic or this ethnicity. And I'd like to dispel that just by simply looking at the reach of the work, the breadth of the work that we've done in Chicago. There's no community that is immune to stress, which means that there's no community that, that, that doesn't need SEL, right? Or that is above the work. And that's something for us to keep in mind because often when I was in the classroom setting, I would look at my high flyers, the students that are walking through the door and I would kind of have tunnel vision on those high flyers quelling what was happening with them. And then once those four students weren't whipping dust across the room, I was like, okay, now I can teach. I was so focused on instructional minutes and, and maximizing that instructional time. The piece that I was missing though, is I was missing creating that optimal learning environment because I was always worried about minutes, minutes, minutes. And so I encourage us here, when we think about the lens through which we view the work, to really shed any type of thoughts about it only works for this demographic or it only works for those tier three students that are whipping dust across the room. And really think again, all of us experience stress. All of us needs tools to be ready, right? Us as educators, tools to be ready to teach, ready to be present, and our students ready to learn, ready to be present. So let's start by taking a few breaths. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to find the edge of your seat. And so you're kind of scooting your body to the edge of your seat. I'm going to do this with you. And you're going to roll your shoulders back a few times here. So really think about extending through the crown of the head, rolling your shoulders back, and then focusing your gaze. Now, if closing your eyes is comfortable for you and accessible for you, then feel free to close your eyes. And if not, then focus your gaze. For me, I'm focusing my gaze here on the edge of the mouse for my computer. And so I'm looking at that edge of the mouse not thinking of anything that may be around me, just focusing my gaze and finding some breaths. Noticing the inhalation and noticing the exhalation as you're here. Now, as you take these inhalations and exhalations, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to think of, of pacing the inhalation and pacing the exhalation. So the exhalation is a little bit longer than the inhalation. So for instance, if I inhale for the count of three, one, two, three. I'm going to work on exhaling for the count of four or five. One, two, three, four, five. So we're going to try that again. We're going to inhale for the count of three. One, two, three. We're going to pause and then we're going to exhale for the count of five. One, two, three, four, five. So try that again for three more breaths, inhaling and exhaling. Noticing the rhythm, the pacing of the breath. Not so much that you're trying to control it so it feels uncomfortable, especially for those of us that may be asthmatic, but just noticing the pacing. Noticing that you are in control of your breathing. 
So often in life, we feel like, wow, we are out of control in so many ways, right? We're out of control, perhaps with the curriculum that we teach, the environmental factors that influence us as educators. There's a lot that can feel out of control. But as we tell our students, we also need to tell ourselves that our breathing and our bodies are the one, one of the things that we can control. We can control our response to events and we can also control our breathing. And by controlling our breathing, we're often able to better control our response to events, right? And so when we think about the links between social emotional learning and mindfulness, we think of that, of that need, as I mentioned, to be present, to be ready, whether it's ready to learn or ready to teach. And with that, comes self-awareness, right? The self-awareness is, is such an important, such an integral piece of self-regulation. I can't regulate a behavior that I'm not aware of. But to be able to find that space for self-awareness, we often have to start by finding the breath. So those of us that have a journal or a notebook next to us, or those of us that might be viewing this recording later on, I'm gonna ask you to to, to make a little list of homework, if you will, if you'll forgive me for the term for yourself. When can you find this take three breath? Whether you're in the car, the next time you're triggered in a difficult conversation or working with a difficult student or a student that triggers you, you find yourself being dysregulated, give yourself permission to pause and find these three breaths. Take three breaths, as I like to say. Now you can also do a take five breath, a take four breath, take 10 breath, whatever you've got. But let's start with three, let's start simple. And think of when we can use the simple strategy to focus and be present, be our best selves. So here's, here's a question for all of us. Now, as Mary mentioned, I do a lot, of, a lot of speaking, a lot of work with different districts across the country. And the work that I do is helping them see obstacles that may be present in their school setting, right? Whether it's across the district or in individual classrooms, what obstacles are keeping us from empowering our students to be present and ready to learn? And so is it that we, we are so, as I mentioned, so focused on instructional minutes that we only, we have tunnel vision, we're worried about those high flyers, and then it's, let's roll up our sleeves, let's dive right into teaching. And we forget, right, that, that if our students aren't ready to learn, if our teachers aren't ready to teach, right, if there isn't a, a priority, if well-being isn't a priority in our classrooms, right, then, then whether or not we've got the best instruction, the best curriculum really doesn't matter because those minutes are lost. If a student is dysregulated or a teacher is dysregulated, right, what's happening in the classroom, regardless of all the sparkly bells and whistles we might have going on, right, is so often lost because students or teachers are in that fight, flight, or freeze. They're in that reptilian brain. They're not able to be present and ready to learn, right? So across the country, we have to think, like, what, what are some of the primary obstacles to prioritizing well-being of students and stakeholders? And if I was going to, if you were sitting in front of me right now and I was going to ask you, what are those obstacles? There is a resounding, resounding answer from, from California to Texas to New Hampshire to Baltimore. And what is that answer? Well, it's time. Right? Teachers just don't feel like they have, a time, have the time as our high stakes testing environment becomes even more and more and more high stakes. We again are hyper focused on instructional minutes. Now, if we look at the data, it shows us that's not necessarily working. And so, and so we're cutting, we're cutting, we're cutting more to create more time for instructional minutes without pausing and saying, hey, wait a second. If that didn't work here, why would it work here? And so is there time to implement these strategies? Is there time to pause and take a, take a moment? Having been in your shoes, having been both a classroom teacher and an administrator, I can tell you it doesn't feel like that. But we always have time for the breath. We always have time for three breaths. We always have a minute. Now, I'm not saying you got to do this for 30 minutes because I know you don't have 30 minutes. But do you have a moment? Mm, I think we can find a moment, right? And so what's our solution? What's our we've got three minutes solution? This is called a pop check. And this is something that 
is again framed in all of my books from early childhood to high school, but also something that I encourage the teachers and the school stakeholders and the administrators that I work with across the country to implement. And so what I ask is that you take three minutes to pause, find your take three breath. Find that breath and own it, own whatever's happening with you, right? You might be angry, you might be frustrated, you might be sad, you might be tired, you might be elated, right? And so wherever you are, own that. As my friend Amy Hori says, move through it. Don't move around it, but move through it. Own it. And then once you've owned what you're feeling, find your practice. Find your practice. Now that practice might be just continued breath work. That practice might be a quick yoga pose. That practice might be doodling. That practice may be skin, skimming, singing, skipping. That practice could be all different types of things. But you've got to have a practice. You've got to have a practice. Now, you'll notice my wording here. My, note, my wording is practice. We have to practice this skill. We have to practice this pop check. The same way we ask our students to practice multiplication tables, we have to practice this response to feeling agitated, to feeling dysregulated. Right? We have to practice this because if we ever want to have that automaticity, that sense of like five times five, 25, right? If we want to move out of that fight, flight, or freeze place, we have to practice that response, right? And we know from adult learning data that for adults to change a behavior, it takes 30 days, right? So again, pens are out team. We've got our little homework pad next to us. And so we're going to say like, hey, what can we commit to doing for 30 days? And I'm going to ask you this now. I'm going to ask you this in the middle of the session. And I'm going to ask you this at the end of the session. What can we commit to doing for 30 days, right? Can you commit to, all right, I'm going to pause. I'm going to take those three breaths. And at first, those three must be like super quick, right? Because you can barely take the pause because you just want to respond to your mother-in-law, respond to your administrator, right? Or respond to that student that may be triggering you. And then you're going to own it. What does owning it look like? For some of our students or teachers that I work with, I'll say, write it on a sheet of paper. I'm super angry right now because of this. And then rip that little sucker up in teeny pieces and toss it in the trash, right? And then what's your practice? Is it you write and rip it? You own it, you write and rip it, you toss it. What's your practice? And that practice can vary. The one piece with the practice is looking at that practice and saying, does this practice, when I'm in the classroom setting, model well-being for my students? And does that practice when I'm outside of the classroom setting, if I'm a parent, does it model well-being for my children? And if I'm not a parent, does it model, does it reinforce a healthy lifestyle for me? Now, I'm here to tell you, I am the first one to grab a cheeseburger and a glass of wine, right? I mean, bring it. But at the same time, if I did cheeseburger and glass of wine every day on the way home from work, uh, I don't know how that would be a healthy lifestyle choice. And so what we have to do is we have to look at these, look at these practices with, with, I don't want to say a critical eye, but with, a, but with a real sober eye. So my research partner and I, Dr. Kildren Kim at the University of Chicago, we surveyed about 900 teachers, and they've been, part of a, they've been part of a data collection that we've done over the course of um, the past year. We started with a small group and then grew it to 900 this year. And with all of the teachers that are in that, that, are in that survey, with data that we collected from across the country, right, 30, 40% chose what we would conventionally consider, right, not the, the most solid or sustainable practice, meaning a little bit of wine, a cigarette or two, right? And admittedly, in their surveys, we're like, yeah, I, I get this isn't the best thing for me, but it's my go-to strategy. And so thinking about, like, what is something that you do on occasion, but what's something that can be your go-to practice that's going to make you feel better in the long term, right? Because we have to honor our needs, in the short term, but also look at the long term as well. So quickly, let's take a look at defining social emotional learning. Now today, these are this, our focus is on you, right? On you, which is so, so important, on you. But noticing here that we can use these the same terms, the same lens to view our work in the classroom or in the school setting. So looking at recognizing and managing emotions, looking at that interpersonal piece, right? When our students sit down to take a test, 
they're managing their own stress and anxiety. Gosh, I'm not good at math. I'm not good at math. I'm going to fail this test. And then the student next to them starts clicking a pen and is clicking a pen or fiddling with a pen. And they're like, I want to, I want to haul off and slap this kid, but they can't, but they want to, maybe they do. And they end up in the principal's office, right? We might have those same experiences in a faculty meeting. We might have those same experiences interacting with a spouse or a partner. And so what we have to think of again is pause, recognize what's happening with us, manage those emotions, and then think about how that, how our response, that interplay, right, impacts that interpersonal piece, our work, at home, et cetera. So what does SEL look like and feel like being present, right? Teachers and students finding that space to be their best selves in the classroom and in the world around them. Now that's a lofty goal, right? Being your best self. Am I my best self all the time? Here, can I, can I own that I'm not for you as the presenter of this webinar? Absolutely, right? Absolutely. I have a toddler and I have a three month old that I can't get to nap at the same time. <laughs> So those of you that are parents, on the, I'm sure you're nodding your head being like, oh yeah, sleep deprivation does not make for finding my best self 24 hours a day. But that's all right, because I'm owning it. I'm understanding that it's a process, right? I'm cultivating the self-awareness to self-regulate in my new landscape of being the parent of a three-month-old right when I was getting it down of, of being a parent of a toddler. And so, and so does it have to be perfect? No, I just have to find that space to cultivate the self-awareness so I can regulate it when it's not. And I can give myself a break when I try my best and I still don't do it right, right? Because it's a journey. I don't even like the term right, to be honest, because that would include right, wrong. Just trying my best. It's a journey. I'm aware of the journey. I'm signing up to be aware of the journey. Cultivating that awareness as an educator, as a parent, as a wife, as a sister, as all of it. And so where does mindfulness come in, right? You've heard me talk about making space. And I love this quote from Vic Viktor Frankl, right? What is, what is mindfulness? It's, it's that practice of being present in the moment or finding that space. That space, as we talked about, between stimulus and response. That space as an educator, when there's a student that triggers us, to not jump to shaming language, just to shut the situation down, right? which we know inherently is not good for the learner, not good for, this, not good, good for our classroom dynamic, not what we signed up for, right? Because we're not modeling lifelong learning for a student if we simply are, are shaming them into behaving, right? And even as a parent, what's our go-to strategy? And so again, just that practice of being present so we can be aware, cultivate that self-awareness of, 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 of our response when we're triggered, and also where can we move that's gonna take care of us? Where can we move that's gonna take care of us? Is it, think of our pause, own it, practice, right? Can I move to pausing, finding the breath, finding a practice that works for me, owning what's happening with me, right? That's taking care of me because it's giving me a solution. A solution that might honor the needs of my students, hopefully honors the needs of my students, but also honors my own needs as well. And so we're gonna start with, we did, you know, our fabulous take three breathing. And now we're gonna start with two more strategies here, the MUCA doodle or mooka drawing in a still point activity. And so for your mooka drawing, what I'd like you to do is find a little index card, a post-it note, the corner of your journal. And so I'd like you to find a sheet of paper or something to write on that's about, you know, three inches by four inches or three by five. So I'm going to pause for a second, give you a chance to do that. As we pause to do that, I'm going to ask Mary if we have any questions. Mary, do we have any questions in the chat box that we should address okay. before we start? No, I think everyone's fascinated hearing what you have to say. So <laughs> no questions at the time, at the moment. But everyone, please feel free. If you have something, open your chat box. It's the bubble at the bottom of your screen and type in. Thanks, Carla. Oh, of course, of course. And please do, please feel free. I, um, I like this to be interactive. I, I'd like to serve your needs as I'm here. So please feel free to shoot me some questions. So what's going to happen is that I'm going to give everyone a minute and I've got my little timer here and I'm going to give you a minute to simply doodle 
on your index card or your post-it. And what you're going to do is you're going to doodle a squiggly line, a squiggly line that does not intersect itself. And so you'll notice here, right, it's kind of, it's a, I drew a little curvy, wavy shape. And you're going to draw that squiggly line that doesn't intersect itself without lifting your pen. So there's two rules, if you will, for this activity. To draw your line without intersecting itself, and then also not, not lifting your pen as you do this. Now, this is an ancient Japanese tradition, and what this does is it helps us focus on the present moment. So again, we're not taking this time to check email real quick or hop on our phone and see if anyone returned our gratitude text. Nope. We're taking this moment now to just focus on the task at hand, our mukha drawing. So when you're ready, finding the edge of your seat again, rolling your shoulders back, sitting up tall, finding your breath, and begin. Notice as you practice your mukha, if you're finding your breath or if you're holding your breath. Try to keep your breath fluid during the strategy. Notice as you practice your mukha, what your experience is, kind of that split vision piece. What's your experience as a learner of a new strategy? And what's your experience as a school stakeholder that is going to take the strategy potentially and embed it into your classroom setting or into your work with students? How could that benefit you? And how could that benefit them? And stopping. When you're ready, pens are down. And as I mentioned, kind of reflect if you have a journal nearby. Notice how you felt. And notice again our call to action, which is finding that time for a pop check, right? Pause, own it, and practice. This is a great piece for the practice column because it's something that you can do in the middle of a meeting, a faculty meeting, where maybe a new initiative was announced and you're like, ah, one more thing. And you might feel like speaking out, you might feel like venting, right? But that might not be the best the best time or place, the most appropriate time or place for that. Not that I don't think using your words and finding your voice is critically important, but maybe that venue in that moment isn't. And so instead of speaking out and ranting and venting, you find a little moment to do your practice your mukha drawing, right? Finding your breath. So you're owning what's happening, but you also realize that you need a practice versus just keeping that frustration bottled in. This is a great strategy to use with students, whether you see students one-on-one -on -one or in a classroom setting. Right? And it's okay to say to your students, hey, everybody, right? I, I need a strategy right now because I'm feeling X, Y, Z. So let's all get out a sheet of scratch paper, right? And let's practice our mukha. And I think what's really powerful about that is because we are modeling how to deal with stress and anxiety for our students, which is huge. Because we can't assume that our students have, right, that modeling outside of the classroom setting. Maybe mom or dad or grandma or whatever caregiver turns to the cheeseburger and wine. But instead of once a week, maybe it's once a day. Maybe that's all they see, right? With the opioid crisis in our country that is ever present and ever, ever visible, I think it is critically important for us as adults to speak to our truth. Our truth is that we are occasionally stressed out. Our truth is that we occasionally need strategies to help us get back online, to help us cultivate self-awareness, to help us be our best selves. And it is a powerful piece to model that for our students, to give ourselves permission to be human in front of our students. And with that humanity comes need and it's okay. Because what we want is we want our students to exit the schoolhouse doors and to have these strategies in their pockets. To have these strategies in their pockets that they learned in school. Because if we want our students to exit those schoolhouse doors and be productive, contributing citizens of the world, then we need to arm them with these tools. That's part of what we signed up for as teachers. Now, I know that can be a tough pill to swallow, right? Because I was a classroom teacher and I taught English and I will tell you I love teaching Romeo and Juliet. I loved it. I loved it. I miss it. 
Give me Romeo and Juliet and give me Franco Zeffirelli's version of the movie. Man, I can knock it out of the park. But I taught in a high violence gang area of Chicago. And if I only, only focused on Romeo and Juliet, re ignoring the circumstance that my students, that my students had to navigate every day, I was doing them a disservice. I was grossly underestimating, right? Or ignoring their, what was happening for them, their reality. And so, and so honoring what our students are faced with in today's climate, without, without stigma, without, without generalizations that aren't culturally responsive or reflective, but by saying, hey, I realize you, just like I, as your teacher or as your administrator, need a strategy. Let's practice one together, and it's okay to need one because I need one, right? Saying that out loud, powerful. So we've got another strategy to practice. I'd like you all to hold up your hand, if you would, and cross your fingers like this. So hold up your hand and cross your fingers like this. Now, this was a strategy that was taught to me by my high school psychology teacher, Mr. Graziano. And he would have us practice breathing, and then he would hold up his hand and cross his fingers, and he would say, okay, now, when you're stressed the next time, whether, whether it's in this class for a test or it's another class, find these two fingers and it will remind your brain and your body that you can be relaxed. And so we're gonna try that now. We're gonna again, sit at the edge of our seats, sit up tall, find our breath. Breathing in and breathing out. Then holding up your hand, I'd like you to cross your fingers and just notice. Notice the sensation of the fingers crossed. Notice the sensation of the breath. Notice the sensation of the fingers crossed. Notice the sensation of the breath. Just notice. Now pause for a moment and reflect on a time, like we talked about the faculty meeting with the new initiative that was announced, no time and no money and no resources, right? And everyone's scrambling. And think of, again, that, that sense of like feeling activated, feeling triggered or stressed or the conversation with the colleague or the parent, right? And again, instead of reacting or instead of bottling up, thinking of your self-care needs, thinking of finding the breath. Can you cross your fingers discreetly? The side, behind your back, right? And that will remind you, again, that automaticity, that practice will remind you that in that moment, in that moment where you may be triggered, that you can control the breathing, that you can control the breath. And again, this is an easy strategy to implement with students. And, and by easy, I mean, and I think this is important, we don't need to go buy a fancy kit. We don't need to go, you know, go read a card or do whatever. This is, this is our moment, our simple strategy to implement that doesn't need yoga blocks, that doesn't need something that we spent $500 on. And it, it's, it's quick and easy, but also the why behind the strategy is present. You know, so often as educators or school stakeholders or teachers, we have what I like to call in my book, teacher magic, right? A strategy that we do to get the class, you know, energy up for an activity or energy focused for an activity. And we kind of do all this energy manipulation behind the scenes or in our head. And we never explicitly teach these strategies. And while our class might function like clockwork, the downside to that is without the explicit teaching, our students leave us and they go to a prep period or they, they leave our class and then they go on to room 401 next year and they don't know what works for them. They just know, oh gosh, I loved Miss Jackson's class, right? Or I loved working with Mr. Javier, but now they're in a new setting and they're not sure what worked for them. They just know that they loved that. It's our responsibility, again, because our call to action, our call to the mat is to teach lifelong learning. What we have to do is make sure that we explicitly teach these strategies, not just, again, to make our lives easier at school, because then those strategies are embedded during the day when we need them, but also so our students exit the schoolhouse doors and they have those tools in their toolbox, they have those solutions at hand. 
So let's pause for a moment and think about how our well being impacts the students that we're serving, right? If we're more present, if we're more ready to teach, more ready to be an administrator, then our students benefit from that. Outside of the power of modeling that we've talked about, we are able to be our best selves because we're not carrying the stress from the day, from being stuck in traffic or from, you know, our partner not loading the dishwasher. We're able to bring our A game to be all in is one of my, um, one of my favorite principles likes to say, right? Be our best selves and ready to go. Now, there are some things that keep us up at night as educators, administrators, as school stakeholders. What are they? Of course, violence, violence in schools. This is, this is an unprecedented time in our country. And these strategies, these practices are something that, that we need in these very tough times, but also that we, again, need to embed in the climate and culture of our school. And so our students have these strategies at hand. These, history, these tools to be present, to be focused, to not be overcome with emotion, that they can find regulation. Again, these are tools, practices that we need to teach, that we need to make time for, for teach, to teach now more than ever, right? Now more than ever. An increase in suicides at the high school and middle school over the past three years, higher than ever. And so, and so there is data and need to drive this work, but also thinking about today and, and our call to action, taking care of you, right? Realizing that this is a lot for you to hold, a lot for you to carry. Besides the, the instructional needs of your students and high stakes testing and all the pieces that we've talked about, you are aware of all these trends, these really upsetting trends in education. And you feel that pressure, I'm sure. And so honoring that need and making sure that you're prioritizing self-care more than ever in these times. There are tough questions, right? There's only so much money to go around. Is it money for metal detectors or money for PD? Is it money for self-care for a yoga class or an increased security, right? Drug dogs or service for students? Now, I'm not saying one over the other, but I think that's exactly the point, is I'm not saying one over the other. I'm not saying, okay, we're gonna get that metal detector and that's gonna take care of school violence, right? Or we're gonna have teachers take a yoga class and that's gonna take care of, their, of the security or that's gonna take care of the self. No, 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 no. But what we have to do is we have to balance all of these needs and have real and difficult and challenging conversations that address all of these needs, that move away from the quick fix. And the quick fix is, I scheduled the yoga class, I bought the metal detector, and have real sober, conversations that weigh all of these priorities and all of these needs and address them holistically, right? Because quick fixes don't help anyone. It's all about the practice. So we are the shepherds of self-care. We are the shepherds of self-care in our classrooms, in our school environments. You're on this webinar today or you're watching the recording of this webinar and that tells me that you might be the person who is raising their hand at the faculty meeting saying, okay, everybody, right? We've gotta, we have to think about the needs of our teachers because they're burning out and our teacher retention numbers, right? We, so, so you might be that person. And because you are that person, you have to find the space for self-care. You're leading the charge. That means your plate is big, you're full, you're busier than ever, right? And the irony is, is that that drive that wants you to take care of everyone, to hold that space for everyone means sometimes we neglect ourselves. And so as the shepherds of self-care, we have to make sure that we are taking that time for ourselves because it's gotta be a practice what we preach situation. It's gotta be because it is a tough road ahead. It is, a, it is a heavy lift, right? So we have to take care of ourselves so our tanks are full when we move forward to do this work. Now I have some data from the research that I've done with my partner, Dr. Kim at the University of Chicago. Now you'll notice here, and I'm gonna go through this quickly, but I'm gonna encourage you all um, to reach out to me. I'll give you my email address at the end. We're also presenting this work at the Midwest SEL Summit, and I've got that information as well to share with you. But you'll notice here that your teacher competency 
is, is paramount, is first, when we think of the road to the student's well-being, right? Without your self-care, without your SEL competency, without your ability to model these strategies, these practices in real time for students, we never get to the student self-care, to the student competency piece. Now again, we don't have a ton of time, but if we look at here, in this qualitative piece, looking at you know, what are, the, what are the obstacles? We go back to that question, what are the obstacles? Is it a climate piece? Is it a lesson planning piece? When we look at some numbers here, we look at the climate and culture scale, right? Where are we? Where are we? Again and again and again, we have seen that teachers are hungry for this work. They're hungry for these opportunities to embed these routines and structures, structures throughout the day but time is the piece that they're missing. And so what we have to do is we have to say, yes, 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 instruction is important, but we also have to make time to practice these strategies that are gonna help us be present, to help practice these strategies that are thinking of the well-being of the teachers, thinking of the well-being of the students. And that starts again with self-awareness, self-regulation, understanding need, not apologizing for need, modeling strategies. And so, as my colleague Dr. Kim likes to say, it's all about fidelity, right? It's all about fidelity. Leaving here, we think about our, our pop check, right? Pause, own it, practice, doing that, that three minute pop check, and implementing that with fidelity. We don't need 800 strategies. We don't need a new mindfulness thing that we looked up on YouTube every day. No, 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 no. In this way, less is more. We know that it's practice that brings us to automaticity. So finding your strategies that work for you, finding your solutions that work for you, implement them with fidelity. And then take a look if you're a school leader here, if you're the one who's the SEL champion for your district, then taking a look at buy-in. Okay, everybody, it's a school-wide initiative. Okay, everybody, it's a district-wide initiative. Yes, absolutely, but at year three, right? Let's slowly build common understanding, let's slowly build a culture of collaboration, honor that not everybody might be in the same place to start this work, and, and nurture buy-in gradually. And so we're gonna try another strategy here, another one to add to our list of homework, another one to add for our, our solutions, right? Our practices with the pause, own it, practice. And so this one is called mindful listening. And what I'm gonna ask you to do is again, find the edge of your seat, Roll your shoulders back, extend through the crown of your head, find your breath. This strategy we're gonna practice for only about 30 seconds. And what's gonna happen is you are simply going to find a sound. You're going to find a sound that, that might be an air conditioning vent, that might be noise in the hallway or traffic outside your window, but you're gonna find that sound. And for 30 seconds, you're gonna focus on that sound only that sound. Again, disciplined here. We're not going to take this moment to check email or check our phone. You're going to take this moment for you, for you, to just pause, to just own wherever you are. Practice just listening. Just listening. Listening with intention. Listening mindfully. Your 30 seconds begins now. Go. pause. As we did the first time, noticing that split vision, that metacognitive piece, right? For you. What was your experience in the strategy as a learner, potentially for the first time? And then what was your experience in this strategy, right? As someone that, that is most likely going to take it and implement it in the school setting. Whether you're a teacher, a counselor, social worker, administrator. Notice if you closed your eyes, if you had your eyes open. Notice if you were holding your breath 
if the, if the breath was able to be fluid. Repacing the breath at all. Inhale, exhale a little bit longer. And no right or wrong here, right? Just observing, not judging, but just observing, noticing your experience in the strategy. So then you're more empowered, right? To implement that strategy in real time with the students that you serve. So let's go back here to our solution, that three minute pop check, that pause, wherever we are, own it. My like, gosh, I'm angry right now. Ugh. And practice, what's your practice? Is it the mindful listening? So tuning out maybe voices around you, if you're in a situation where, where, that, would, where that would work. Focusing on the sound of the air conditioning vent, breathing that in for a few breaths, then rejoining the space. You're doodling, right? You're take three, take four, take five breath, whatever it may be. What's your solution? What will work for you? What's something that you can practice, that you can practice, and then in turn, you can model for your students. Now we have some data, and I love that, with a big exclamation point, because data does drive this work, right? And so my colleague, Dr. Kim, and I developed a tool called Class Catalyst. And the reason we developed this tool, Class Catalyst, is because we noticed that when we asked teachers to implement this pop chart piece, that it was difficult for them to implement the pop chart and also manage a class. And so what we did is we came up with a web-based tool where the students walk in the room, they're on a one-to-one -one device, and they check in. So they've got a little, they've, we've got a little web-based tool that gives them, cues them to take a breath, cues them with an activity, and then records that data in real time for teachers. Now, why is this important? This is important because so often, as I mentioned, as a classroom teacher, I was really focused on my high flyers. I was focused on those behaviors that I could see, right? That I could see. I could see a student whipping a desk across the room, but I couldn't see a student that was cutting. I couldn't see a student that was silently struggling, that was disengaged. Or, if I'm going to be honest with myself, I didn't make the time because that student wasn't interrupting my instruction. So if there was a student that might have been a little bit slumped over, a little bit disengaged, maybe a hoodie up over his head or her head, I was like, well, they're not, I'm going to plow on through. I got a lot to cover today. Yikes. And we noticed that that's the trend more and more and more across the country, not because teachers don't have hearts in the work, but because the expectations regarding testing and regarding time have become so high that teachers are feeling that pressure. And so we created this tool where students walk in and they log in. This takes three minutes. And then the teacher gets, you'll see here, this pie chart, right? 5% of my students are angry and triggered and absolutely not ready to learn. 25% are almost ready. I need to do a quick breathing activity, but 70% are ready to learn. And you'll notice here it says start an activity. And so the teacher can either lead a group activity using the tool or Right? They can facilitate their own practice that they use, whether it's the doodle, do, the, the mooka or the, a doodle, right? Or breathing activity. And so you'll notice here that data is driving the use of the activity. Data is driving the, the instructional minutes that a teacher may or may not take to address student readiness. And so it goes beyond my own tunnel vision of like four students you know, they usually throw desks aren't so I can teach. And it gives me data to make that decision. Now, taking a look here at disciplinary referrals. This is a school district that we've been working with. Um, we started working with this school district in 2000, was it 2017? And you'll notice here the change in disciplinary referrals. The change in disciplinary referrals, oh no, it was 2016, I believe, over time. So if we look at where they were 2015 and where they are now, and that's, we don't even have the data from the rest of the year. This is powerful, powerful stuff. And so in closing, let's take a, let's take a look. How does our well-being impact the students we are serving? How does our needs, our emotional needs, how, how, do, how, how does that impact our students, right? 
Because if we're not ready to teach, can we expect our students to be ready to learn, right? If we're not modeling those strategies for our students, how are they, how are they gonna learn them, right? We can't say that they're learning them at home and we can't blame parents. Oh, well, these parents nowadays, blah, blah. Parents are working harder than ever. Parents are, are triple shifting at the factory, right? They might want desperately to model these strategies for students, but instead they're thinking about putting food on the table. We can't fault them for that. We have signed up. We have signed up, right? To teach our students these lifelong learning skills. We gotta take care of ourselves. We gotta fill our tanks. So we can be our best selves in the classroom or best selves when we're working with teachers or leading a team, right? The sense of school, school and the opportunity that it brings for voice, for creativity, for self. Social emotional learning, that attention that it brings to this other side of education, right? I don't wanna say the non-instructional side, maybe we can say the social side. And then thinking about this connectedness of teachers and students finding their voice in the world and how powerful that is. When we talk about the integration of SEL into academic content, those teachers that do it the best are the teachers that can honor their needs emotionally, honor their students' needs emotionally, and integrate, right, the social emotional learning activity or the centering or the mindfulness activity right before a test because they understand that's when students need it. They've been there. They get it. They've voiced it for their students. They've modeled it. It's a practice. It's not our social emotional learning time is Wednesdays from 1.15 to 1.45, right? Is it that all our students are triggered on Wednesdays from 115 to 145, right? Is that when we're triggered and we need it? But when it becomes something that's fluid and included into the classroom climate, the school climate and culture, that's when it's most impactful. That's when you see that integration happen fluidly, when there's that sense of connectedness. So now let's set some goals together, right? Let's put this work into practice. You guys have heard me here up on my soapbox, you know, for the last, last hour. So what goals can we set now? You've got your notes next to you. You've got your homework, if you will, if you'll forgive me for the term, right? How can we think about we're implementation? Now, if we look here at Cole Eisner's work, right? Cole and Eisner's work, we've got these best practices. These practices embedded in the school, we should look at safety. We should look at predictable routines, consistent expectations. So again, this isn't when the class is just regular, throwing a strategy at everybody, hoping that it sticks. You know, I love that an uh, administrator that I met with last week was saying, you know, SEL can feel like pin and jelly to a wall, right? And she's right. She's right. So instead of that pin and jelly to a wall, let's think about safety, let's think about predictability, and let's think about consistency. Let's find our pop check. Looking here at your notepad or your, or your notes that you were taking, where are we? What can we do? Can we pause? Can we own it? Can we practice? What does that pause look like for us? Is it finding the breath? What does owning look like for us? Is it kind of saying it in our minds? Is it writing it down on a sheet of paper that we rip up? Is the practice the writing and ripping it up? What can we, what can we do to implement this solution three minutes a day hopefully 30 days, hopefully more than 30 days moving forward for ourselves is a key to the healthiest us, the best selves that we're bringing to our schools, but also for our students. Now, I, I threw these here just as talking points. I know that we have a Q&A, right? And so we can come back to this slide at the end, but thinking about what are your steps for setting your goals? What can make your goals stick? What support do you need? from your community to make that goal, really bring that goal actionable, make that goal real. Now again, I promised I would share some information on the SEL Summer Summit. I'm on the coordinating for this, coordinating committee for this summit, and I'm very excited about it. Now that being said, if you're with us and you're like, I wanna send a bunch of teachers, I can also help secure bulk discounts. I really wanna make this affordable for teachers, for school stakeholders, for administrators. Part of making this work accessible and affordable, equitable, is, is very much part of my mission. So please reach out, right? You can Google or search Illinois ASCD Summit, or you can email me. My email address is right there, and I will get you the information, and we can talk about a way to make it affordable for all to attend. Now here again is my email address, the email address of my organization. 
I please know that I'm an email away. I'd like to support you in any way I can as you move forward with this work. It's so important to me. And then as we close, Mary, I'll go back to that slide with the questions. Oops. Um, and then see if anyone has any questions or comments as we close. If anyone has questions and you want to put them in the chat box, you may do so. You could also just um, unmute your line by clicking on that microphone to ask the question. Um, I, I have a question. Oh, please. Uh, I'm just, I'm just wondering, you know, this, I just felt so energized with that okay. breathing activity. And I was a little tense as we started our webinar and that just relaxed me so much. How can, how do you um, help teachers bring this to their classrooms when sometimes students of different ages may, may be uncomfortable? not willing to accept the idea of all being mindfully listening or, or breathing. Mm -hmm. What might you suggest? Uh, what a great question. Um, and I talk a lot about these modifications in the trainings that I do, but making sure that we start with it being accessible, right? And by, by that understanding that some of our students just might not be comfortable in quiet, they might not be comfortable in silence. And so maybe you start the activity by using music and cueing the students like with a mindful listening activity to start by listening to music, right? Maybe you even give them the doodle drawing and the music at the same time, right? And so you're, you're saying, I understand that my students, they may or may not be comfortable in quiet, especially your students who've experienced trauma, quiet can be triggering. Right, which is why I was cueing us when your eye don't don't necess, don't don't mandate that eyes are closed. Eyes could be open, right? Maybe have music playing, maybe have give the students an option of doing something with their hands. And so understanding the needs of your students and starting incrementally, right? There's no I did this strategy the right way or the wrong way, or I failed a breathing activity, right? Instead, understanding the needs of your students and making those modifications, looking at incremental progress, if you will, as we go. Great question, Mary. Thank you, thank you. Um, I want to make sure that we are open. If any others have questions they'd like to share now, either verbally or in the chat box. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I what that program that you used the, where the kids checked in mm -hmm. and what what is that called? That's called Class Catalyst, and. and Again, my research partner and I developed that. Um, and if you'd like more information, just shoot me an email and we can talk more about that. Perfect, thank you. Oh, of course, we're in the um, early adopter stage for, so we piloted it last year in the early adopter stage this year. We are accepting more districts into our cohort. There are um, some qualifications for those districts that want to participate, you know, understanding that that there's, there's leadership buy-in to, you know, it's teacher right. support that's needed, but we'd love to chat with you if you're interested. All right, thank you. Thanks. Any others? Well, I just want to thank you, Carla, on behalf of all of our participants, on behalf of LOCI and CEC. This was just an amazing uh, demonstration and practical application of things that you can do. Like you said, you don't need a lot of fancy programs. You need commitment. You need a few minutes of time. And what a change this could make for students as they're learning, just to make them available for learning and make all of us feel that calm that we need to really engage in the hard work of, of teaching and learning. So thank you today. Uh, you are the end of our LOC webinar series with CEC. Um, and I hope that those of you who have participated have benefited from it as much as I have, as we've learned a lot about social emotional learning, its various aspects and, and some real practical applications, just as we learned from today. Um, I hope we'll all investigate this summit that you have planned oh, this summer, Carla. I think it sounds like a wonderful opportunity with some great presenters and speakers. So thank you everyone. If you'd like to listen to this again or share it with anyone, it will be at the CEC website, which is cecweb.org. And that recording will be there for you to listen and share with friends. It's 
I can see this as a wonderful uh, learning experience at a faculty meeting, just right. listening to Carla do this and do some practices that we can do together. So thanks everyone. Um, I hope the rest of your teacher appreciation week is a wonderful one and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. We thank say you thank so you much, as Mary. well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.